Coming up for this week in computer hardware, Intel stumbles, AMD gains, Oculus reveals the Quest, NVIDIA's got ship dates for the RTX 2070 GPUs, and let's talk gaming headsets, but high quality ones. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 485, recorded on September 27th, 2018. It's good to be AMD. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch weekly show that aims to bring you the most useful, most engageable, most delightful, most, I don't know, sociable. Sociable? I can't even speak <laughs> words today. Ryan, save me. Ryan Stroud, PCPer.com, the man, the myth, the legend, who, much like myself, is probably wondering, where exactly did... The idea for the Echo A-L-E-X-A enabled microwave come from? <laughs> I think it came from all of our hearts, Patrick, for the inevitable future in which every single one of our devices is IoT intelligent connected. Uh, well, and, IoT anyway. Well, yeah. What I need now is an Echo device that will take the burrito out of the freezer and put it in said microwave as well. Just by voice command. Um, so, basically so we are missing a robot. crucial step. A burrito robot. <laughs> a burrito bot. Yeah, a burrito exactly. bot. Um, yeah. If you have this is Taco seen... Bell marketing for them. <laughs> is there a burrito bot? Am I unaware of a burrito bot? I, I, um, not that I know of. No. Have you? I mean, did you see the kind of the the crazy list of stuff? It wasn't it wasn't particularly crazy except for the microwave. Um, but when you when you go to Amazon and the page and i was i was looking at some of this stuff when the announcement hit next week and all i could think was you know the is going to be sorry alexa is going to be everywhere um the echo auto which is not the first device to bring uh alexa to your car that would actually uh uh you know the rove with the vivo rove which is a, a monoprice brand with the vivo did that first uh garmin did that first the echo show is a strong sign that uh uh the amazon is aware of what's going on in terms of uh uh google's home devices uh you know specifically a certain mirage from lenovo um I'm not going to talk about the sub, but I got to say the Echo Link and the Echo Link amplifier are particularly compelling to me because they look like to be mm -hmm. decent quality devices that actually have a subwoofer out and the ability to do uh, uh, outputs possibly to fairly sophisticated uh, audio gear. I'm very curious about those because I'm an audio nerd. Um, you know, the Echo input bring a lot to your sorry to your own speaker. Um, they're also competing with uh, some of. Uh, you know, I, I wonder if Belkin is making the Amazon smart plug or if that's something they just decided to do in-house. Not that it's hard to do a smart plug, but this is one of those moments where it's like, wow, look at all these partners on Amazon who are having their products uh, emulated uh, by uh, stuff being built directly by Amazon. Uh, but there's also, there's, I mean, there's a ton of speakers coming out. This thing fascinated me. I reviewed this on Tech Thing this week. Um, this may hmm. look like a Netgear Orbi satellite, and it is, uh, but it's also a Netgear Orbi satellite, and it's got Alexa built into it. You can just see the four pinpoints for the microphones. Oh, the really? Huh. Yeah, uh, and it's also a speaker that was engineered by Harman Kardon, um, and it's somewhat hmm. fatter than a standard uh, uh, Netgear Orbi, Orbi uh, satellite, but you know, offers all of the speed, has two Ethernet adapters instead of four, and it's got, you know, no USB thing on the back, which you can't really do anything with on the on the Orbeez, but uh, unless that update has gone through and I just missed it, which I'll check for after the show. But, um, you know, this is another case where it's, you know, A-L-E-X-A -E is showing up uh, in some really interesting places. I thought this was kind of fascinating. Um, it's not just an incredibly powerful tri-band satellite for your mesh home network. It's also <laughs> ALEXA and a speaker. What if it were? What if it were also a microwave, though? You know, well, then it wouldn't be in my house because my. There wife is some is irony in a <laughs> microwave as part of a wireless network 
that microwaves usually totally screw up wireless networks, you know, 2.4 gigahertz and whatnot. So there's some oh, interesting, yeah. interesting thought there. You know, I, I don't know. Yeah. Like at first I, I heard that they were making a microwave and I thought that was dumb. And then I thought, you know, I bet there are, I bet the vast majority of people that have microwaves don't know how to use like all the buttons Settings. and the, the, the features and the capabilities, you know, Hey, uh, defrost three pounds of chicken, right? Sounds like a really good right. idea. Um, so I'd be curious to see what the uptick of it. It's obviously, it's a fairly low cost device. I think it's what, $69 or something like that. So it's, it's a yeah. pretty, pretty entry level microwave as, as far as microwaves go. I don't know. It's been a long time since I bought a microwave, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, I think microwaves I, are one I, of those things where there's lots of opportunity for margin. Yeah. Uh, I'm intrigued. I mean, I'm intrigued. $59. Yeah. So a little bit cheaper than that. Well, it was funny because some, some friends of mine, uh, uh, they do a lot of work with CNC mills and stuff like that. And there's kind of the CES for the CNC milling trade or the machine tools trade or whatever it is. I don't know the name. I apologize. It takes place uh, a couple took place a couple weeks ago in Chicago, and they were laughing because there is this big voice controlled CNC mill, and it's like it's going to be such a time saver. And the problem is, is like you know you would tell it to get this tool or execute this operation, and then it would basically be like, are you sure? are you sure you want me to do that? And then you would have to, you know, confirm. And then it would start, you know, grabbing the tools and doing the thing. And they were like, it was great, except it took us twice as long as it would normally take us to just press a button. Um, and I think about that a lot when I, I, I look at things, I, I think, you know, microwave for 30 seconds or heat popcorn, uh, is probably going to work on this one. I'm hoping it has a banning feature where if you burn popcorn, you will no longer be allowed to. As soon as it detects popcorn, uh, <laughs> it will automatically go into a shutdown mode and uh, shutdown mode and warn everyone in the office. Um, that would be cool if you could send out like an SMS. Or if you're, if you're reheating fish, fish something in. like yeah. that too. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly where I was going. Like the, the fish warning. <laughs> That's um, pretty good. You know, it's 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 interesting and weird to see where a lot of this stuff is going. But uh, I mean, you can you know. I mean, you could imagine this being a coffee maker. You know, you say, yeah. you know, Echo, uh, have my coffee ready for me at 750 a.m. Right. As you're walking upstairs, right. stuff like that. You know, I, if we just figure out a way for the for the technology to remove the coffee grounds from the bin, from the mesh, yeah. whatever the filter. It's the same. Yeah, that's it's it's really basically mean. burrito bot is what you're asking for again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, also not burrito bot, <laughs> but widely anticipated and desperately wanted uh, by lots of people, I suppose. Um, Oculus announced the standalone Oculus Quest, formerly known as Project Santa Cruz, uh, in their keynote today. Um, shipping next spring, $399 with touch controllers, 50 plus games at launch. Essentially, this is a high end. Uh, standalone vr headset and if you're thinking like well why isn't the oculus go high-end well it's not the screens um this actually has uh, four headset mounted cameras inside of it to do positional tracking which is a pretty big deal um so it won't just be head turns it'll be head turns hand gestures overall body movement and one of the demos i really would like to see is they were apparently playing uh gunfire games uh, dead and buried which is a sort of arena wild west shootout where you can get a bunch of people in a room uh using their virtual blasters at each other and apparently uh it'll actually map if you're in like a living room and there's a couch it'll map the couch into the game this isn't the first time mm. we've seen something like this but apparently it's much much easier to set up based on what i've heard from people uh that were there um built-in speaker rig similar to the oculus go which i found incredibly effective same display as the oculus go which is like 16 by 1440 per eye i believe or is that total um i should double mm. check i was so sure of that uh just a few hours ago um but I, i'm very curious because they're promising 50 plus games at launch um you know they're promising an excellent experience for 400 bucks um you know, and a standalone experience because the my my complaint about the Oculus Go is like, yeah, I can turn my head, yay. Um, not having sort of like six six degrees of freedom was a little maddening uh, on the Oculus Go, um, but it's looking really interesting. It's looking to ship in spring 2019. No mentions of battery life. Uh, no, 
So they did. Little... They didn't mention during the during the keynote what processor it was on. Um, they have since confirmed that it's the Qualcomm Snapdragon 835 processor, um, which actually brings up a couple of interesting points with it, right? So the Oculus Go, the one that's 199, uh, or is it more than that? 299, 199. I think it's 199, right? Um, depending on the memory capacity you get, is powered by the Snapdragon 821. This is the 835. There are sh phones shipping today that use the 845. Right. And we would expect them to announce uh, uh, the next generation Snapdragon part by the end of this year, like in the December time frame, because that's kind of their their pattern that they've been on for a little while. Which, you know, the some of the statements made by uh, the Oculus team on stage was that it would bring PC, like uh, uh, PC level VR experiences. Right. Right. Which I'm a little concerned that they're maybe setting uh, the bar too high. I think I think it's a six off six degrees of freedom device, uh, which means, you know, you're untethered. So it's going to be a, a better experience in that way than it would be with a Rift or a Vive, uh, because that is that's six off as well, meaning you can walk, move, turn side, whatever. Uh, but you're, you don't have the, you have a cable attached to you in those instances. But in terms of just like raw compute power. You know the the 835 is a is a very reasonable SOC. It's got a lot of graphics performance, but it's not up to a desktop PC. So mm -hmm. it'll come down to a lot of what the developers, uh, how they target this device, how they build their games and their applications and whatever experiences they are going to create for the Quest. Um, but I think I think setting up and saying that this is going to be better than what you get on a on a Rift. It might be a disservice to them at the end of the day. I mean, <laughs> screen resolution, image quality, you know, that could actually be better on the Quest. It is a much newer device. They may have uh, better sensors for tracking. But just in terms of raw horsepower, uh, the Quest is going to struggle to keep up with any of the, um, you know, minimum rated spec for Rift right. or, or Vive uh, machines. But for 400 bucks, it, you know, you don't have to buy a PC, right? So yeah. th there's obviously the a trade-off. I just, yeah, yeah. And I just, I just wonder if they have over-promised to some degree uh, that uh, then what they'll be able to deliver on. Although I am very excited to try this. Uh, any, any VR Star Wars experience I'm down for. So what is it? Vader's, uh, Vader's Quest, Vader's something. Right. I, it's funny. I, I seem to be finding different uh, quotes on the resolution of these on the different oh. uh, articles I look at. So interesting. Yeah, interesting is a gracious word for it. Um, <laughs> you know, the other thing was that came out this week. Uh, well, I guess technically the microwave came out last week, but uh, Nvidia announced the GeForce RTX 27, 2070 availability. Um, and it's gone from like being a mystery to October seventeenth, and uh, you know, shop starting at four hundred ninety nine dollars, five hundred ninety nine dollars for the Founders Edition. <sighs> How are we feeling about twenty series GPUs this week? Because you, um, you were not, you know, you were not feeling the love as much as I would have expected. I mean, I'm mo I'm mostly unchanged with this. I mean, the availability mm -hmm. time frame doesn't doesn't really change much for me the pricing is still what it is um performance wise we'll have to see where it falls in line but i mean it is it's a significant drop maybe 60 to 60 percent of the speed of a of a right. 2080 ti and then you, you know you're falling off at least another 30 40 you know 30 percent even 40 percent maybe from a 2080 so right. this will be another instance where Reviews and analysis will have to look at where it sits in the product stack of 10 series cards and where it stacks up. You know, in this case, it'll be more important than ever where it stacks up against Vega, right? Because right. I think now we're going to be squarely in Vega 64, Vega 56 performance territory. Um, although the the pricing will be as such that we'll have to have the same debate that we had before, and hopefully. I think what we'll see is the 2070 will be closer, will be a better improvement over current existing products than the 2080 mm -hmm. was. Uh, but until until we actually see the numbers, it's it's hard to say. Um, 
It's a two hundred dollars, a two hundred dollar delta between the twenty eighty and the twenty seventy, FE and uh, uh, retail, like you know, lowest minimum MSRP that they'll that they'll advertise. So, uh, we'll see. It, hmm. I don't know, I don't know. I, I'm hopeful still, you know, and and I think that the seventy series cards, the nine seventy, the ten seventy, uh, and eventually the ten seventy Ti were some of the most well received products by the community in terms of right. they tend to be the best performance per dollar segment for a lot of for a lot of gamers. So six ninety or five ninety nine and four ninety nine are, are pretty high prices to to fall into that same in that same metric, but Yeah. Maybe I mean you're maybe. looking right now at a ten eighty for four hundred and seventy bucks, ten seventies at three hundred and eighty bucks. Um I feel like yeah. I haven't done any intense analysis but it seems like the prices are coming down um 1080 ti's are anywhere from like 650 to 789 there's a bunch of sales running on them so it seems like inventory is being cleared um, yeah hmm. yeah and but and there's still and from what it looks like there's still a decent amount of availability like you know just looking up gtx 1070s on new egg you can find them a fairly healthy collection of them still there uh and that and that will be the thorn in nvidia's side for the foreseeable right. future until whenever these 10 series cards kind of kind of flutter away into the wind um <laughs> and hopefully are not replaced by a bunch of cards on ebay that are you know used cards but uh i think right. that i think we'll find that will be the case too i'm kind of really curious to see what happens with the you know there's going to be a – yeah, I mean there's going to be a lot of car – I are the miners waiting for the 10 like the ten series cards to run out or are they still making money at this point? I think one of the uh, – if you want to look at it this way, the, so the mining performance on the Turing cards is going to be better. But I think the higher price is going to keep them away and they probably right. won't touch – any of the 20 series cards until the 10 series cards are gone. And even then, obviously that's a significantly slower um, market than it once was. If you look at Bitcoin and all the associated uh, alternate currency options, they've all been very stagnant for a while. And so I don't, I don't see a lot of, I don't see a big push in that coming back. So um, I think if you're seeing people sell off, it means that they're, they're kind of getting out of the mining market as a whole, right. which Again, I'm totally going to be fine with. But if you look, <laughs> if you look on eBay, like I'm looking right now, there are GTX 1070s used, likely having been mined with, you know, 250 bucks. Hmm. Um, yeah, 260, 270, yeah. 250. So there, there are, there's going to be a lot of options there, and and we'll see how uh, how long that that segments last a, a quick search of gtx 1070 on ebay results in 2918 results so wow yeah yeah and some of those like the sponsored ones are still crazy nuts expensive like how about a thousand seventy two dollars right. for a gtx 1070 asus card not a not there's, a good deal don't buy that one guys there seems to be some sort of marketing technique on ebay where people offer uh, products for considerably more than they sell for MSRP, even when there's a tremendous amount of availability on that. Or maybe it's just some of the things I've been shopping oh. for. But yeah, yeah, it's I, it's oh man, there's just the, catch the one every of, once in a while. I got to say, the number of sub uh, 215 millimeter GPUs is starting to drop. <laughs> so I maybe yeah, I may have to buy one soon, or it may be a long time before I can finish that mini ITX build. So. Oh my goodness! Shifting gears, uh, MSI GeForce RTX 2080 Gaming X Trio review, a cooler and quieter tuning. Is this the first non-NVIDIA uh, GPUs you guys have looked at in the 20 series? Yep, we've got this one. Uh, we have an ASUS review coming up probably later today. This this MSI card, the Gaming X Trio, is, uh, you know. Basically, an aftermarket card with a giant aftermarket cooler on it. Um, mm -hmm. It performs very well. It is, you know, more expensive than the than the FE. Actually, let me go back to the bottom here and check and see where we're at. Eight forty nine. So it's a fifty dollar price premium over the Founders Edition of the RTX twenty eighty. So this is not an option of hey, let's go below the Founders Edition. 
This is better cooling, uh, quieter cooling. I mean, look at those RGBs. Clearly, uh, <laughs> clearly an enthusiast level card. It's a big, it's a big beast of a of, of a of a graphics card. Triple fan design, fairly aggressive, um, kind of. I don't know, gamer style <clears throat> cooling. I would say lots of sharp edges. Two eight pin connectors on this, as opposed to an eight plus six pin connector. Mm -hmm. So you get. Uh, in theory, a little bit more headroom there. Um, from right. a performance perspective, uh, it is probably just a handful of percentage faster than than the than the 2080 Founders Edition. Um, nothing significant out of the box, but it does give you a little right. bit more headroom for overclocking. Although one thing that we're finding now with these cards is they're all still kind of topping out at the same frequencies because of the way GPU boost is implemented, the way the voltage limits are implemented. And until people find ways around NVIDIA's voltage regulation, um, you're probably going to see peak performance, peak overclocking settings relatively close amongst uh, competing, competing products. Now, the difference is you'll get much lower temperatures, right? So I think this right. um, this MSI card in its manual top overclocked performance, I think it was 110 megahertz GPU offset. It kind of settled at sustained clock speeds of 2,000, 25 megahertz. Um, it was running at like 71 degrees Celsius or something like that. So a good 10, 9, 10 degrees Celsius lower than the reference card, than the Founders Edition. So that's that's a positive to look at. Uh, but in terms of overclocking, you're actually about in the same realm as the, as the Founders Edition. And we're still, you know, this is only the first card. We'll see as we get more retail cards in and we start to see what other people are posting in their reviews of retail card reviews if uh, this is going to be the norm. I did see a post over on uh, Gamers Nexus, which is a good... A review YouTube channel that they mm -hmm. um, kind of they did a, a hacked mod to attach a water cooler to a GTX or an RTX 2080 or 2080 Ti. I don't remember which one. And their basic result was that the overclocking capability didn't really change from the stock cooler with the mm -hmm. with the air cooler. It just meant you could run it quieter and cooler than you could with uh, with that design. So. That's kind of that's kind of where we're at, and it's not really that different than where we were with the 10 series, right? The 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 aftermarket cards really sell on if you're trying to lower that temperature, if you're trying to lower that sound level. Um, Nvidia has been taking away the ability for their partners to really differentiate through voltage <laughs> changes and and really 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 pumping up the clocks. So. You know those changes you might do to differentiate your product from the other people that sell our product that you think is your product? Well, we're going to eliminate those just like Intel did. And the consumers will thank us. What? Um, yeah. I, this is not the next story in the lineup, but I just wanted to read it because it's uh, so close to uh, Microsoft's annual Surface Fest. Um, Microsoft Surface laptops regain consumer reports recommendation. Our new reliability ratings prompt the change, but the Surface Go falls short on performance. And you heard it here a while ago. The Surface Go is tiny and portable mm -hmm. and great for browsing the web if you're really patient. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I mock uh, with no love in my heart. But, uh, you know, it's uh, they got pulled out of the, the recommended status and Consumer Reports uh, ratings because there were so many reported uh, – uh, reliability uh, and uh, you know quote last year we removed that designation because of poor predicted reliability in comparison with laptops from other brands um, the latest survey uh, indicates that Microsoft's reliability is now on par with most other laptop brands and quotes which allows them to once again recommend uh, the brand at uh, at consumer uh, consumer reports um, and that's all part of, you know, Consumer Reports. They have a bunch of subscribers. Uh, uh, and then they they uh, talk about owner satisfaction now and the score and the overall score along with the brand reliability. Um, 
This doesn't indicate that uh, some of the high-end ones aren't underperforming compared to other products with the same CPU inside of them. Um, although there have been some tweaks that have made that less, uh, not as horrendous as it was for a while. Um, but yeah, they're, uh, uh, <laughs> quote, the Surface Go is the only Surface that isn't getting a recommendation. The company's other models, including the Surface Pro, Surface Laptop, and Surface Book 2, do score well enough to be recommended. So, <laughs> and uh, I also thought it was interesting that Microsoft was like, please evaluate these as laptops, uh, not as laptops and tablets, um, which is an interesting and subtle distinction. Um, but, uh, you know, it's also interesting that that a product can be recommended but have kind of lackluster performance because of, of the form factor. But uh, it's interesting. Um, it's an interesting kind of note. I also am always kind of fascinated because... Consumer Reports is one of the only places that has tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of subscribers that actually right. report on the reliability of their products. So, you know, and they pretty much nailed the, you know, the the washing machine kind of thing. So I, I, I do not wish to dismiss their systems. Uh, they've also been around for a long pile and set the standard for a lot of this stuff. They did. Um, switching back to the rundown, uh, DisplayMate declares the new iPhone I'm still calling it the XS, uh, the XS Max, <laughs> an A-plus display device. Um, they were really impressed by the automatic color management, uh, excellent factory display calibration for Rec. 709 and DCI P3 color spaces, quote, virtually indistinguishable from perfect. Um, my partner in crime on AVXL, Robert Heron, big, big, big fan of the work they do over at DisplayMate. Uh, he was really impressed by, uh, just exactly how uh, enthusiastic they were about this. And uh, it's pretty impressive. Um, I also want to give a shout out. I have uh, several friends of mine who ordered these for kind of first possible delivery. And uh, some of the photos my friends are taking are really spectacular. Um, <laughs> In terms of uh, this is certainly bringing the low light performance or, or the sort of like, you know, like I'm in a horrible lighting situation uh, right now because I am backlit and uh, you know, normally I'm smart enough to not be in that situation but we're in the middle of doing some work on the house um, and I have a light in front of me now if I had for chance an XS Max sitting here instead of uh, you know using this light and this camera I have um, we'd probably have a much more natural skin color for me um, and there would be <laughs> Uh, you know, much more detail from the dark corners around me, which might not be positive uh, uh, from a aesthetic standpoint, but would be impressive from a technological standpoint. But the color gamut's really amazing. Um, and I got to say, uh, I'm really impressed by some of the photos I'm seeing coming out of this. Because if you want to take photos of pictures in, in low light situations or, or unfortunately lit situations, which so often happens when you have a small child that won't stand still, um, they're doing a really good job. Uh, XS Mac component cost estimated at uh, four hundred and forty three dollars, which was a little higher than I would have thought for no particular reason. That's the two hundred fifty six gigabyte version. Um, Tech Insights did a teardown of the new device. Uh, Quotes, nearly $50 more expensive than the estimated $395.44 component cost of the new 64 gigabyte iPhone X. Um, you know, basically, uh, as we've come to expect, they think the most expensive component in the device uh, is the Max display, which is pricing out at something like $80.50. And then the A12 chip and modems are pricing out at like they're guesstimating $72. Um, mm. Followed by storage, which is still incredibly expensive uh, for desktops and laptops too, not just phones. So it's, uh, and it's also just overall a much more expensive device to manufacture than the iPhone 10. Which may be why it's the iPhone XS. Um, <laughs> I still, yeah, I still keep saying that, and I've talked to many people who are in the industry uh, and they call it XS, and I can't tell if it's on purpose or on accident. Still, but it just feels so natural. So. <laughs> that I mean, that 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 bomb cost gives you a pretty good idea of what their margins are. It's kind of in line with what Apple has. Uh, predominantly shown their margins to be when they do their earnings reports and stuff. So, right. um, yeah, makes sense. Uh, moving in a radically different direction from uh, uh, 
super one over one thousand dollar phones. Um, I actually will be testing out a four hundred gigabyte micro SD card from SanDisk in this phone later on today. They were on sale on Amazon yesterday, and uh, for well under a hundred dollars, like eighty nine ninety bucks. And I'm <laughs> really curious because I feel that there is artificial differentiating being done on a lot of the Android manufacturers because. What appears to be the same sort of SDXC chipset, and I could be wrong, right? Because this this Google uh, Google this uh, Motorola Moto G6 phone I have, for example, it does not support 802.11ac. So perhaps uh, the chipset that supports the SD card does not support more than 128 gigabytes. Uh, but we've run into a lot of cases where. Um, flagship phones are reporting that they support two terabyte. SD cards, which don't exist, or micro SD cards, um, but uh, their lower level phones, which are, are less expensive or entry level or, or modestly priced phones, uh, claim support for only 128 gigabytes. And I'm trying to decide if that's uh, to keep people from buying jank high capacity cards and creating tech support issues, or if that's because there's actually a physical limitation, or if they put a, a software kind of cap on something inside of there. So hopefully I will have uh, an additional 400 gigabytes of capacity in this phone tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I wait with bated breath to see how that works out. And if it doesn't fit- Have you, uh, have you determined what you're going to do with that? Uh, yeah, I actually was running like 80 or 90 gigabytes of music uh, or si probably 60 gigabytes of music. I, I tend to hoard the photos on my phone. Um, I will say the Android yeah, backup to, to, uh, to Google Drive has been fast. I upgraded my Google Drive, so I just have full resolution photos being backed up off my phone, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, it makes me less likely to keep 9,000 photos on my phone, number one. Number two, uh, I store a lot of lossless music on Tidal. And uh, I've also been testing something called Cobuzz, which is a French lossless music manufacturer that's looking to move in the U.S. market with a very flaky Android application. But they also offer some pretty uh, some pretty interesting stuff. But um, for me, I just store a ton of media on it. Netflix online, I was using a bunch when I was traveling uh, a few weeks ago. Downloads. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing, you know, you get three or four hundred, uh, uh, you know, flack songs and, and a couple seasons of something on Netflix. And all of a sudden, 128 gigabytes just seems tiny. So we'll see how that goes. Sure. Um, Intel 14 nanometer, <laughs> Intel, Intel 14 nanometer availability issues uh, continue. You found this up on Digitimes. I was kind of fascinated and slightly horrified by this. Um, what's going on with Intel? Is it getting worse? So I don't know if it's I don't know if it's getting worse, but this there's just more information coming out. This is uh, apparently a quote from Compal, uh, the president of Compal, which if you don't know who that is, it's one of the largest ODMs that builds notebooks and PC systems that uh, people rebrand and resell. So in terms of size and and, and kind of influence in the market, they're they're fairly high up there. Um, he noted that so far Intel has not yet given its downstream partners, which they would be one of them, a clear schedule on when the shortages can be resolved. Um, you know, we I think we talked about a week ago or so that Intel. I don't know if we talked about it on this, but Intel. There were rumors going that Intel was was moving chip production to like chipset production to TSMC, or maybe they were going to migrate um, some chipsets they had moved to 14 nanometer back to a a larger process node in order to free up space in the 14 nanometer uh, uh, production facility, so they could get more processors out and modems out or whatever it is that they're that they're apparently falling behind on. And this is just kind of another data point for that. Acer apparently also noted that the shortages are not only affecting individual brands, but the notebook market as a whole. Um, they said they originally expected notebook shipments to grow 5 to 10% sequentially in the third quarter, but they've cut that to 5% or less. Um, so that's that's a pretty significant result if that ends up being the case. Um, and Inventec, another one of the ODMs, expects third quarter shipments to rise by single digit percentage sequentially and stay at the same level in the fourth quarter. Um, so again, a little bit lower growth than people were expecting. Um, so, and in this one, basically the, the, the compound president said that this was unlikely to go away until the second half of 2019, which is, uh, you know, a full year away. Right. So that would be a long time right. to have to deal with, with a lot of these shortages. Um, 
but some other people are saying that it might be in the first quarter of 2019 that that gets that gets fixed. I, I honestly don't know the answer to this. How uh, how quickly and uh, how how fast Intel can maneuver its production facilities and and all of that. And I, I don't know what their automation capabilities are for kind of moving that stuff along. It's not mm -hmm. as simple as going into a piece of software and saying, uh, you know what, actually, let's just move that over there and we're done. Uh, it's definitely more complex than that. Uh, otherwise, they would have, you know, fixed this before it became a problem and a public facing problem at that. There you have it. Oh, my goodness. Somebody give a shout out. Uh, uh, well, actually, uh, you were saying this actually may give AMD, or I should say Digitimes was suggesting this may be another opportunity uh, uh, for AMD to, to get even closer to the 30% global desktop market share. Uh, at least in Q4 2018. I mean, if they go, do you, I mean, do you think they will aggressively drop prices, or do you think they will just have availability, uh, and people will take advantage of that? I, I think, I think from AMD's perspective, um, you probably don't want to drop prices. You want to keep your margins mm -hmm. high. You want to. Right. Uh, a lot of times, if you're if you're dropping pricing, it's somehow admitting that your product is subpar and that you have to, you can't compete in the areas that matter in performance or efficiency or what have you. So they'd probably keep pricing the same. Um, but there are some, again, this is a Digitime story, so we got to take it for what it is. But there are some people claiming that they might hit that 30% global desktop CPU market share uh, right. by the end of this year, which would be the first time they've done that in like 12 years, I guess, yeah. since kind of the, that peak of, uh, of the Athlon days. And... I, you know, there's also been stuff where HPE has put out some documents. Uh, this is their server division saying, look, we're having some shortages on Xeon processors, but here is here are the AMD Epic-based servers that we recommend to replace them, right? And that was a document that they apparently put out to a bunch of uh, potential customers and everything, right? So if you're, mm -hmm. if you're Intel, that uh, scares the crap out of you. If you're AMD, you're super excited about it. Um, and... It just just in in favor of AMD, things just kind of keep happening uh, to give them a boost, right? They they built the right product. They they have fantastic performance and efficiency. You have the Intel 10 nanometer issue, and then the 10 nanometer issue is pushing back on on this 14 nanometer supply issue. So right. there's a bunch of things that kind of you know add up to this potentially being a, a substantial a substantial year for them and, and kind of going into 2019 with the same with the same momentum and yeah and that Digitime story talks about um, you know maybe getting five percent of the global x86 server market share by the end of this year too which would be a significant a significant number as well plus they've got Zen 2 coming they've talked about that sampling in the first half of 2019 there are uh, there's a lot of potential for for gain in the short term. For AMD, which is right. not something that we get to talk about a lot, we always talk about forward-looking stuff and 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 uh, you know years ahead and in advance. But in this case, uh, if you're AMD, hopefully you're stepping on the gas pedal and pushing all this stuff through and and, and getting that marketing and sales and um, distribution channels all spinning up. Hmm. Good time to be AMD. Uh, it is. Also, look at their stock price over the last year, and you it's hard to argue that statement. <laughs> <laughs> True that. Oh, my goodness. Hey, I want to give a shout out. Uh, I'm looking at uh, uh, Odyssey's Mobius headphones, the headset with the headset tracking built into it. It's a planar magnetic headset that is uh, designed or, or built to try to bring a, a new level of audio to the uh, to the gaming community. I'll talk more about this in depth on next week's show because I'm, I'm still playing around with some of the settings in this. Um, it, uh, it works wired. It works wirelessly. Um, they've got some interesting sound modes built into it. For example, footsteps, which is designed to emphasize a chunk of frequencies that are likely to make it easier for you to hear people sneaking up on you. Uh, I could use help on that. I'm sure a lot of people could, but uh, it's an interesting, uh, interesting product because Odyssey is a high-end headphone company. You know, previously, uh, you know, their least expensive uh, on-ear headphones were like five hundred ninety-nine dollars. They're looking to sell this for four hundred. They did a Kickstarter product uh, project with it. Um, I'd be very curious to talk about this some more with you next week and get your opinion on some of this stuff. Um, uh, the other thing I want to do is give a shout out to a couple friends of mine. Um, 
I think we mentioned uh, Vocal, V-O-K-Y-L dot I-O. And uh, these are a couple of friends of mine who work for JDS Labs who make really nice, um, you know, super high performing for the money uh, headphone amplifiers and DACs. And a couple of the guys there, Nick and Jude, decided that they were tired of crappy sounding gaming headsets and decided also uh, to do a, an Indiegogo. Uh, and it kind of blew up in the last couple of days. Um, it's really impressive. They're using a, a magnesium aluminum driver, a traditional, uh, uh, a traditional dynamic driver in there. Uh, I haven't had a chance to play with a microphone, but I got a chance to demo the uh, uh, for extended period of time to demo the headset, and it was really impressive for music and for gaming. Um, the drivers are coming. They found the drivers in Shenzhen, and then uh, they're actually building them and and doing all the machining for the ear cups out in uh, uh, St. Louis. Um, or more accurately, Southern Illinois, but they live in St. Louis. But uh, I want to give a shout out to those guys and congrats to them on hitting their uh, Very cool. uh, hitting their uh, their Indiegogo goal. So apparently, they've been furiously calling suppliers and going like, "Oh my God, we have to start building stuff now." Um, you know, those are selling for I want to say two hundred and seventy five now. They had a, a less expensive level earlier, but um, they feel really nice. They were trying to create uh, something that's you know something that would blend well with your everyday carry collection of titanium goodies, right? Uh, they feel good in the hand. They're extremely comfortable, um, and uh, they should uh, be curious to see who's the first person to throw them and and uh, whether or not they can they can uh, manage to damage the densely uh uh the the aluminum the heavily cnc milled aluminum construction um i doubt it but you know it's first time for anything but uh it's nice for me to see a lot of better audio experiences um showing up on the gaming side of things because so awesome so often um you know uh there's a lot of crap with lots of LEDs on it. <laughs> and some of the some of the LED covered stuff is actually not bad and a lot of the stuff a lot of the gaming headsets are designed with like we're going to do something that looks like it's on the, you know, a character in a video game but doesn't actually uh, sound particularly good. So it's interesting to see some 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 sort of high-end approaches to gaming audio, uh, and I'm pretty excited about that. So Yeah, that sounds cool. V-O-K-Y-L dot I-O, and of course, uh, Odyssey is A-U-D-E-Z-E dot com, and I'll be talking about the Mobius on uh, next week's show. So I got to hear it for a little bit at Can Jam, at a Can Jam LA earlier this year, and I've, I've gotten to spend a significant amount of time kind of playing with it with watching surround sound content or 5.1, 7.1 surround sound content, gaming, uh, and music, amongst other things. So more on that later. Um, are you – I mean, we got a couple weeks before the 2070 ship. I don't think there's anything coming from AMD for a while. Is there, is there anything exciting you can tease us to or – is it just kind of I mean, like we still have we still have some retail RTX cards to look at? Um, I think we'll probably see, you know you I I think we'll see some stuff in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> I think that's what I'll say. We'll see we'll see some we'll see some new stuff in the next couple of weeks that I think will make it uh, will will reinvigorate the enthusiast group from a from a different perspective uh, than than graphics. You mean like so. GPUs with built into them, just <laughs> like that. A L E X A. Yeah, just <laughs> like that. With A L, the Google <laughs> Home mouse. Okay, G O O G L E. Move oh, three man. pixels to the right. Yeah, exactly. Just <laughs> that's exactly Are how I would sure think. Are you sure you want me to move three pixels to the right? <laughs> bing, bing, bing. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, we mock, except this is our lives. I'm Patrick Norton. <laughs> I'm Ryan Shrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch.